Hi everyone! I am planning on putting out a video on the biblical definition of predestination, which will also clarify the points of the poll I posted. But I had a comment in a thread under the poll yesterday that I want to quickly respond to first. Somebody accused a commenter of voicing a, quote, humanistic opinion, unquote, for saying that God does not force us to believe and that it is man's responsibility to do so. Now, anybody talking in Calvinist platitudes does not last long in my comment section. Such people parrot what they hear without actually understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm, as 1 Timothy 1 verse 7 says. This is a common accusation from Calvinists that Bible believers, since they affirm what scripture clearly states, namely, that the unbeliever can believe the gospel, put men in the center and give the glory for their salvation to themselves. They confound the act of responding in faith to the gospel with salvation itself, which is 100% from God, and no one who has been saved by believing the gospel would ever give glory to themselves for their salvation. And this is just one of the many ridiculous accusations Calvinists make to make themselves look virtuous and give the impression as if all they cared about was the truth. Their own truth, yes, but not the truth found in scripture. But what is humanism? There isn't only one single definition. The way it was defined changed over time. However, the essence is that man is the center of everything. Here is an excerpt of the Wikipedia article on the term. Most frequently, humanism refers to a non-theistic view centered on human agency and a reliance on science and reason rather than revelation from a supernatural source to understand the world. In the Bible, the term does not occur. However, we find the phrase tradition of men, which is set in opposition to the revelation of God. We find it in two contexts. The first is the Pharisees. Jesus said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. And, Making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. This is from Mark chapter 7. The Pharisees had oral traditions, which they also called the oral law. It dates back to the Babylonian captivity and was later written down as the so-called Mishnah. This oral law was claimed to go back to Moses himself and was regarded just as valid as the law of Moses itself. Jesus on several occasions rejected this oral law, pointing out that it actually contradicted the Mosaic law. Now, the Pharisees thought of themselves as the paragon of piety and believed that they were the ones who glorified God the most in their adherence to all their man-made doctrines. They were mistaken. The second time we find the phrase is in Colossians 2 verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Other translations say human tradition. And cheat here means literally plunder you or take you captive. In a translation comparison, my eyes fell on the NLT, which is of course not a translation but a paraphrase and not to be recommended, but it's interesting to hear the sentence the way we today would speak. Nobody would say, for example, beware of vain deceit. So here it is. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. High-sounding nonsense, I like that. And here you have human thinking, which is in essence what humanism is. So, here we are explicitly warned of philosophy. This is very pertinent when it comes to Calvinism, because Calvinism is based on nothing but philosophy. It is high-sounding and sounds like Bible talk, but all it is, it's just imposing philosophy philosophical concepts unto the Bible. I think at some point I will be making a video showing the philosophical roots of Calvinism. 
Calvin heavily leaned on Augustine. He quotes him over 400 times in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, and he admitted, Augustine is so holy within me that I could write my entire theology out of his writings. The determinism adopted by Augustine, which goes back to pagan philosophies, included the view that, due to the fall, there was nothing left of the fact that man was created in the image of God, humanity is seen as worthless worms. There is no reason why God would give them any attention and care as creator. God is seen as towering over and detached from his creation, which is now unable to even respond to the salvation he provides, and God must unilaterally infuse what is defined a gift of faith to select individuals with no comprehensible reasons as to why this choice of his is made. One of God's attributes is his omnipotence. He is all-powerful. In Calvinism, however, this becomes the dominant characteristic overshadowing his other attributes. Or would you say that sermons and teachings about God's love for his creation are what comes to mind when you think of Calvinists? While there is no doubt about the fact that God is all-powerful, in his dealing with men we find his attributes of love and compassion and long-suffering highlighted in the context of salvation. In Daniel 11, we read an interesting prophecy about the coming Antichrist. It says that he shall not regard the God of his fathers, but that instead he shall honor a God of fortresses and a God which his fathers did not know. In the KJV it says a God of forces. The Antichrist will worship a God of forces and Calvinists worship a God who forces, hidden in the eye of the tulip, irresistible grace. In 1 John 2 we read that while the Antichrist is coming, many Antichrists have already come. The spirit of deception is already at work, and Calvinism sure belongs to that category. And no, I am not complaining about the supposed biblical facts because I am driven by my emotions. Another ridiculous accusation that Calvinists make, or because I just cannot handle the plain truth. No, I reject this philosophy for the sole reason because it is unscriptural. At the beginning I pointed out that the Bible presents the traditions of men as being in opposition to the revelation of God. The Calvinist image of God is based on philosophy, the tradition of men, and not on God's revelation of himself. But how has God revealed himself? In John 1 verse 18 we read, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And Hebrews 1 tells us the following, God, who at various times in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So God has chosen to reveal himself in the person of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 8, we read, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Man in the Old Testament is frequently referred to as the son of man. What is interesting about this passage, though, is that it is quoted in Hebrews 2, and here it is applied to Jesus. In verse 9, it says, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Note, by the way, that it says he tasted death for everyone. Notice that it says that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. That doesn't sound like the God of forces, does it? like a God who is set on exercising his power over everything else. No, in Philippians 2 verse 8, it says about Jesus, And being found in appearance as a man, 
he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Here we see the Son of God humbling himself, lowering himself to the level of his creation, to man, becoming a man himself in order to save his creation. He was found in appearance as a man. I did say that, in general, this term was synonymous for men in the Old Testament. However, it was not exclusively used this way. In Daniel 7, we read the following prophecy. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So this is a prophecy of Jesus. The Pharisees were familiar with the book of Daniel, of course, and they knew exactly what Jesus was alluding to by calling himself the Son of Man. On one occasion, by the way, he said something that makes absolutely no sense in Calvinism. In Luke 19, verse 10, he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If the elect are chosen from before the foundation of the world, how is it, pray tell, that they can get lost along the way, have to be sought by Christ and saved? And what are the implications of this? If they got lost once, can they get lost again? The believer loses salvation, that is? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Why? Because it's not biblical. In John 19, we read how Jesus, after having been arrested, got scourged. After that, the soldiers put a crown of thorns on his head and put a purple robe on him. Pilate, after affirming that he finds no fault in him, presents Jesus to the crowd and says, Behold, the man. This scene has been painted numerous times over several centuries, and the name of those paintings was Ecce Homo, the Latin for Behold the Man of the, of the Vulgate translation. Yes, Ecce Homo, Jesus became man because man cannot save himself, but he came as close to him as possible, becoming a man himself. Reaching out his hand to his creation, who, although incapable of saving themselves, can reach out and take hold of the outstretched hand of the Savior. Receive by faith the salvation offered. Jesus said such astounding words like, Daughter, your faith has made you well, not my faith infused into you has healed you. No, God does not give his glory to another. No man can boast in the salvation he has received. But God decreed that it is by faith that man is saved. This is the way he ordained for man to be justified. Nobody who lays hold of the salvation offered to him is a humanist. He simply receives the salvation offered by God to the humans he loves. Trusting in, believing in, Christ's work. Yes, God loves humans. Jesus became man. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5 Eke homo.